And uh, Luke started his preach with some jokes. So I've decided to take a leaf out of his book. Ooh. I know, everybody's nervous. Because uh, if you want to know how good my jokes are, then go back and watch the COVID times online services <laughs> and watch me try to fill gaps and forgetting the punchlines to all my jokes. But never fear, this week, today, I've learned from the sins of the past, my sins of the past, and I've got my jokes written down yes. in order, yeah. okay. both the setup and the punchline. So, I mean, I've got nothing, I've, I'm not going to say that I've got any kind of exceptional comic timing, but here we go. What can go wrong? All right, so why did the entrepreneur yeah. invest in a bakery? Wasn't enough dough. Because she wanted to make some dough. <laughs> I mean, Jason Hamilton is proving himself to be the dad joke king. Oh, yeah. in the, uh, oh, yeah. Front row week after week. There should be an ongoing price tally. Okay, there's a bit of a theme with these jokes today. Okay, why are millionaires sticky? Come on, you can do it. Why are millionaires sticky? Think along the same lines. Because they're rolling in, in dough. dough. Yeah, that's right. No? Seven. seven. <laughs> it's going over like a lead balloon, guys. All right, okay, my last one. It's nearly over. One more. What is it called when you steal a rich person's dinner rolls? What is it called? when you steal a rich person's dinner rolls. Now this one I think you might need the visuals for the punchline. Are you ready? Why Are you ready, Ari? When, when we're getting to our big moment, we practice this. What is it called when you steal a rich person's dinner rolls? Ari, hyperlutin, gluten, lutin. <laughs> Guys, if you're watching this back online, there were only five people in the room. That's why the applause was so high. <laughs> oh, it's good, mate. It's good. It's good. It's good, mate. It's good. Well, I've yeah. just been convicted of lying. We need red faces. Okay, the title of today's message is How to Leave a Legacy. And we're on. Yeah, explain it to a later. <laughs> How to leave. <laughs> A legacy because we're in our series about treasure in heaven. And I personally am inspired by entrepreneurs. I love reading stories about entrepreneurs. And I've studied some in my university studies. I did a whole unit on creativity and entrepreneurship. And I love to read the stories of people, and particularly women, who've taken a big risk with a new creative idea and seen it grow and build into something that the world hasn't seen before, but that can't just sit back and not notice. But for me, the entrepreneurship stories that I find the most inspiring are those which are maybe a bit less noticed by the world around us. These are stories that are not just of people who were maybe able to build a big successful company and make a lot of money, but the stories of those who wanted to leave a legacy that would last beyond their lifetime. I don't know if you know any of these, the stories of people who are relatively unknown and who were motivated by an understanding that even their creative ideas and entrepreneurial gifts and skills were given to them for an eternal purpose and to bear lasting fruit that they might not even personally get to enjoy. And that's really what our series about treasure in heaven is all about. It's about finding the balance between building things of a financial legacy here on earth while always keeping our perspective on things in the heavenly realm being the higher order things. And it's a difficult tension to manage in our world. Jesus told us this kind of person understands his kingdom better than those who are merely seeking to build financial security or wealth for themselves or their own immediate family. And here's what he said. It's kind of our theme verse for this series. It's in Matthew 6. He said, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, 
there the desires of your heart will also be. But this is a tricky passage because what does Jesus mean by this? Is Jesus saying here that we should try to live without money here in the earthly kingdom? Is Jesus saying that the poor are more holy than the rich? Is he saying that we're sinning if we enjoy nice things like houses and holidays and cars and clothes? Well, let me let you in on the big secret, the big reveal of this series, and that is this. Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. And if everything is spiritual, then what we do with our money is spiritual. And if everything is spiritual, then how we view money and financial legacy in our earthly lives is intricately interwoven with our eternal treasure because we have to in our society and culture have money to survive and God knows this and so he's asking us to do a deep internal dive into our hearts and align our hearts and our minds with the spirit of God which lives within us to get our perspective right about money, wealth, finance, and legacy. And it's a difficult thing. Like most things in our spiritual growth, it takes us the entirety of our few earthly years to explore everything that Jesus has to teach us about this subject. Now, I've deliberately called this message how to leave a legacy rather than how to build a legacy because I actually think it's relatively easy in our world to make money. I actually think it's not that hard to make money in our modern day world. But what gives our money true spirituality and legacy is our willingness to build something we can leave behind when we go to be with Jesus forever. So to leave an enduring legacy in this earthly kingdom, there's a few things, a few principles that we're going to unpack today. And I just want to say too, to set this up, that you know we're building this series on the back of a series about tithing. And you know if you have dreams about wealth creation and about leaving legacy for your family and for you know the community, the church, and for you know even. Um, even other kind of great work in the world that you can do with finance and that finance empowers and enables, then really the very basis of that is to first get your heart right about tithing. Because tithing, that act of giving the first 10% of everything that God's given you back to him through the local church, that's the secret sauce. That's the thing that puts the supernatural power of God on the other 90% of the money that you've got to play with in your decision making. So I've, I've just kind of put that is in as like prior knowledge, learn, recognition of prior knowledge, all right? We've covered that. Yeah. You can go back and watch and listen to those sermons anytime. And now we're talking about the other 90%. What do we do with the other 90% in order to build and leave an enduring legacy? So first of all, we've got to do this. We've got to think eternally. Because it's thinking eternally that puts money and what we do with it in the right perspective, in the right order. Thinking eternally helps us see money as the useful tool and resource that it is in this earthly kingdom while not giving it more value than spiritual things. It keeps it in the right order because the spiritual always comes first. Everything is spiritual. And so every decision that we make about what we do with money, how we build money, how we earn money and how we spend it, how we save it, how we invest it, it's all spiritual. And so if we first of all can align our spirit with an eternal perspective that we're here for a few short years, maybe 80 or 90 here in our society and culture, 
and that that 80 or 90 years might empower us to build something that's financial, that's got some kind of legacy. But the most important thing is our eternal salvation. Let's go to some Bible and see what the Bible says about getting perspective about finance and God's kingdom. In 1 John 2, at verse 15, in the message paraphrase, it says, Don't love the world's ways and don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in this world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, these are all so natural things in our lives. All of those things has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Oh, that's a powerful reminder that this earthly kingdom has not been built to be the eternal kingdom. That what Jesus is building in his people is the eternal kingdom, the thing that lasts forever. And so reading verses like this helps us get things back into perspective. Let's have a look at something Jesus said in Luke 19, uh, sorry, Luke 12 at verse 29, again in the message paraphrase, so it's a bit of a, a modern way to look at something that Jesus said. It says, what I'm trying to do here is get you to relax. Oh, heaven's up. Jesus wants you to relax today. Everybody, just everybody taking a deep breath. <sighs> Jesus himself said it. What I want you to, yeah, that's beautiful. Very relaxed there, Ollie. Good work. You're leading the room. What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, not to be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. Oh, isn't it true that you've got to slow down in order to even be aware of how much God has given us? People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. So steep yourself, focus yourself, immerse yourself in God reality, God initiative and God provisions. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Oh, if that's not relaxing, I don't know what is. Don't be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. Beautiful words from Jesus. The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. When we're able to think eternally, we prioritise what matters most. And what matters most? Our own salvation, our own spiritual growth, and then the salvation and spiritual growth of our children and those nearest and dearest in our world. These are the most important things, are they not? That's right. And then everything else that matters falls into place after that because it's no use building a successful financial inheritance for your children when they haven't found their true inheritance mm. their lasting eternal inheritance which is their own relationship with Jesus yeah. because all of that will, will, will be cast away all of that the moths can come and steal and destroy this passage from Matthew 6 that we're centering ourselves in is reminding us that there's no use leaving nice things like houses and cars and superannuation and whatever else it is that you might be able to build in your 80 or so years to your kids when those things don't matter when compared to our eternal treasure, which is our salvation and being called the dearest friends of Jesus. So we've got to think eternally first. We've got to get things in order, get our priorities right and know that our salvation and our spiritual growth and the salvation and spiritual growth of the people we love most is the most important thing. The second thing we've got to think, the second mindset we've got to adopt is about thinking generationally because Proverbs 13.22 says, good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren. 
some versions say to their children's children, which I think is quite thought provoking. Good people <coughs> leave an inheritance not just to their children. You know, even in our society, even kind of people that are a little bit old fashioned, there are many of them that are trying to leave something for their children. And yet the Bible encourages us to think beyond one generation. Good people leave an inheritance to their children's children. So thinking generationally means we're thinking beyond just one generation or the next generation. And, you know, I might surprise you because I look so young, but I am getting older, as are you, by the way. I know. It's hard. We'll go through it together. And um, I've got my first child leaving home in a few months, so that's a new new season for us. (laughs) (laughs) She's very, she's very loved, as you can see. (laughs) And um, and also we have our youngest child reaching adulthood in only a few more years. Like, if you're a parent, the days are long, but the years are short, and so we can see that just over the horizon, just around the corner that our youngest, our little baby, will reach adulthood in just a few short years. And so for me, as somebody who's getting older, whether or not you are also getting older, I'm thinking more and more about the future generations of my family that I won't ever get to meet face to face here on earth. And it's a sobering thought. I've I've adopted a practice of journaling quite extensively and I journal quite vulnerably and I would probably be horrified if my children read my journals while I was still alive, but I do it with the mindset that the future generations of my family, who I won't ever get to meet because I'm only given 80 or so years here in this earthly kingdom, But the future generations of my children will get to look back to great, 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 great grandmother, Pastor Rach, who poured out her heart on the page. Every up and every down, the really challenging times and the real mountaintop moments and saw me process what God was doing in my heart. And hopefully they'll get to see that my heart stayed faithful even through pain even through challenge and turmoil and difficult situations and situations where I didn't know when God's timing was going to come through for me. And so I'm absolutely motivated to leave a legacy of a spiritual nature first. But I'm also deeply motivated to leave the church family I'm a part of, and my own family, an inheritance which practically helps them to see God at work in their lives. And I'm here to tell you that money is just one of those ways that practically empowers people to keep fulfilling the mission and calling and purpose and destiny that God's put in their hearts. And so I'm deeply motivated to do whatever I can in my short time here on earth, to build something enduring that will empower the next generation and the generation beyond that, to have a platform to stand on where some of the work's already being done and where they can go wholeheartedly, all in, after the things that God puts on their hearts, empowered with all the resources that they need to outwork God's call on their lives. And so like I said to you, I'm inspired by entrepreneurs and I've recently been inspired by learning about one of those kinds of entrepreneurs that I mentioned earlier, somebody who you may have never heard of, but somebody who's built something significant, who is now passed away and is still making an impact in our world here in Australia. Okay, so... This guy's name is Vincent Fairfax. Has anybody heard of Vincent Fairfax? Sir Vincent Fairfax. And in 1962, he established a a charitable trust that is now the Vincent Fairfax Family Foundation. We're going to call it VFFF from here on in. Okay? The VFFF. The founders' children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren have built on these foundations and VFFF has now gifted over $200 million to Australian communities. 
He was a devout Christian, Vincent Fairfax, and he and his wife, Lady Nancy Fairfax, built a great family and stayed faithful to their uh, Christian beliefs. They were deeply involved in the Anglican Church and some of the some of the big donations that VFFF has funded and lended funding to, um, you might have heard of, like Alpha Australia. So part of the reason that we here at Beyond Church get to use the materials and resources of Alpha Australia for free every time that we want to run an Alpha course and reach people with the good news about Jesus in our little community here in Cessnock, it's because people like Vincent Fairfax was investing in something that would continue to bear fruit long after his earthly time was done. And so he passed away in 1993, at which time his wife Nancy became the chairman of the foundation. And when she died in 2007, she was forward thinking and she bequeathed a large part of her estate to the foundation. This gift transformed the potential of the foundation and will enable the family's philanthropic work to continue for many generations. Isn't that inspiring? It inspires me to build something like that that maybe nobody will ever hear about. I've got dreams in my heart about financial things I'd like to do in my lifetime or set up in my lifetime so that there'll be a pool of resources like this family were able to build for the future generations to continue to build on what God is doing across the earth for generations to come. Let's have a look at something Vincent Fairfax said. He said this in 1973. So this is just after, after the foundation has been established for a decade. He says, this action, establishing the foundation, was taken on the basis that my children are well provided for. So he hasn't, hasn't let his family go wanting. He's still provided for his children and hopefully in their turn will contribute further assets to this family pot of gratitude for all the benefits we have received since landing in Australia in 1838. So he's not only tried to build something to financially bless his children, but he's tried to build children who get the enormous privilege that they've been born into and their responsibility to continue to be legacy pouring out generations of this same family. And, uh, and now I thought it would be inspiring to show you a quote from somebody who's a third generation family member of the Fairfaxes. This person said, we wanna be effective in our giving, leave an impression, a lasting legacy. We have to be strategic in our giving. We have to collaborate with others and take ownership of our learnings on what has and has not worked. Good philanthropy is leading by example, particularly as the new wealth of young entrepreneurs is increasing. Our role is also to encourage others to give. Our role is also to encourage others to give. In order to leave a lasting legacy, we have to think generationally. Here is a family who saw their God-given gifts and talents, even for making money and building great wealth, as spiritual, yeah. as having eternal significance. Yeah. And this inspiring couple, Nancy and Vincent, managed to get the balance right between building great wealth and building a great family, which would leave a wide reaching legacy, impacting multiple future generations and bearing fruit long after their own earthly years. The only reason I know about this foundation is because I personally know somebody who was the recipient of a $50,000 grant to outwork an entrepreneurial uh, idea in a small rural community in Australia. And these are grants that are given out every year. So I don't know if you're an entrepreneur in the room and you've got a great idea, you can go to the VFFF website and there are grants of $50,000 given out to individuals every year from this foundation to empower people to get their entrepreneurial dream started. 
When we think generationally and eternally, it changes everything about what we do with money. It empowers us to say no to things that are here today and gone tomorrow, like KFC, nah. so that we can build something which will last. Sorry, that was unfair. It helps us resist the temptation to live the way the world does. Have you heard this before? Spending the kids' inheritance now. It's an incredibly selfish, unholy perspective to have on what you do with your money. We, have, we don't live the way the world lives. We live by a higher way, which is selfless. It's always pouring out. And so instead of spending the kids' inheritance now, we live selflessly and generously. And in the words of our families, one of our family's favourite Christian financial advisors, Dave Ramsey. No? Yes, there, I've got to laugh at me. When we think eternally and generationally, we practice the discipline of living like no one else now so we can live like no one else later. Which leads us to point three, which is embrace accountability. Ooh, I got very quiet. Because as much as everything is spiritual, then everything in our spiritual lives is designed to be outworked in community. It's always been God's plan that our spirituality cannot be separate from being in community. There's no spiritual growth outside of community. So the people who leave the greatest legacies have learned that their capacity to do so is intricately linked to their willingness to be accountable. And who are we accountable to? Well, we're firstly accountable to God to keep laying down our lives, plans, dreams and hopes to his leading. Because Proverbs 16, 9 says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. So absolutely, first of all, we're accountable to God. It's a daily task getting our heart right about continuing to align our heart and our spirit and our own personal dreams and goals and desires with thinking eternally and thinking gener uh, generationally. But then we're accountable also to our closest relationships for how we deal with money. So wives and husbands, this means we're accountable to each other to make sure we're putting God's kingdom first in our hearts and our decisions about finance. We should be holding each other accountable to our decision to build God's house first through tithing. We should be holding each other accountable to our money being spiritual and building extravagant generosity into our financial decision making. We should be holding each other accountable with our short term spending so we can empower our long term legacy building through budgeting and regular financial check ins. And if we're not married or not married yet, we should be holding ourselves accountable to a close Christian friend or a mentor or a parent, somebody who's in the family of faith and understands that everything to do with our money is spiritual. We've got to be spiritually mature and emotionally mature enough to be open and transparent and authentic enough followers of Jesus that we can have open and transparent and authentic conversations with our life groups and our close Christian friends about where we still struggle to give God our complete trust in the area of money and finance. And brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to be above reproach in our money dealings, honest and full of integrity. We're called to a higher way of how we deal with money than the people in the world around us. We do money a kingdom way. We're honest, we're above reproach and we're full of integrity. Proverbs 2, 7 says, he grants a treasure of common sense to the honest and he is a shield to those who walk with integrity. We pay our taxes. We're honest and full of integrity. Finally, we have to embrace our freedom. And the truth is, it might be too late 
for you to leave a financial legacy. And that's okay, because financial legacy, you know, the two greatest assets that you've got available to you to build and leave a financial legacy are time and discipline. It's really not about how much money you earn. It's really more about what you do with the money that you have and how long you do it and how faithfully you do it. And so that's okay because God's message to each one of us today is one of freedom. It's not one of um, condemnation. God doesn't want anybody to leave this room feeling less free about the possibilities about legacy leaving than what they came in. That's not God's heart for us today. He wants us to embrace our freedom. And so the good news is, no matter what mistakes you might have made in your past about money, today is another opportunity to turn the page. And the most important thing is your salvation and your spiritual growth. The most important thing is not the financial legacy that you will build and leave. Let's have a little read of Galatians 4. It says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, and that might be for you today, the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us, no matter what age you are, to call out Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Will you receive your inheritance today? Either everything is spiritual or nothing is spiritual. And you may not be an heir in this world, but I'm here today to tell you the most important inheritance you've received is freedom from sin and death. You don't have to work to earn it. You don't have to go into the family business to receive it. You just have to believe and accept that it's yours. And this inheritance is of more value than anything you may be able to build in this earthly life because it is given from the eternal kingdom and that's how long it lasts. Why don't you close your eyes and I'm just going to make one simple invitation. If you want to receive your eternal inheritance, be set free from the bondage of slavery today. Then we're going to pray a simple prayer that invites Jesus to take over right in the depths of your heart and who you are. And if that's something that you want to do today, why don't you just raise your hand right now where you are and show me that you're making that decision, that you're receiving that inheritance. We're going to pray this prayer in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to pray also over each one of us and everything that's happened that's that's financial in your world. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and minister to your children. We cry out to you, God, Abba, Father. You're our Father. So even if our parents have left us nothing, of a spiritual nature or a financial nature. We've got you, God, and we've got everything. Lord God, for any of us in the room that carry hang-ups about money, finance, anybody that's carrying worry or anxiety, Holy Spirit, minister to us today. Maybe sense your presence 
And may we feel your freedom to live a new way, your way, less weighed down from today on, less burdened, chains released. Church, why don't you pray after me? Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit.